to our first segment of Black Poets Then and Now. My name is Kara Roseboro, and I'm excited to lead you on this eight-part series over the next four weeks. We're starting with pioneering African-American female poet Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was born in 1753 in West Africa, either Senegal or Gambia, it's not quite known. In 1761, at the age of seven, she was captured and brought to the United States where she was sold into slavery. She almost didn't make it. From a young age, Phyllis suffered from chronic illnesses and was deemed terminally ill by the slave trader that sold her to John Wheatley. Nevertheless, John brought her back to the Wheatley household where she served as a domestic slave. Phyllis Wheatley grew up alongside John and his wife Susanna's children, Nathaniel and Mary, and from a very early age it was clear just how intelligent Phyllis Wheatley was. The Wheatleys decided to educate her along with having her fulfill her domestic duties. She learned to read and write and went on to study English literature, ancient history, astronomy, geology, Latin, Greek, and probably most importantly to Phyllis, theology. It's believed that the first poem Phyllis Wheatley wrote was her poem to the University of Cambridge in New England, although she didn't publish this poem until 1773. In 1770, she published a poem titled Elegiac Poem on the death of the celebrated divine and eminent servant of Jesus Christ, the reverend and learned George Whitefield. She addressed this poem to the Countess of Huntington in England, and she did this at just 13 years old. However, fast forward to 1969, Carl Breidenbaugh, a noted historian, found another poem published by Wheatley three years before that in 1767 when she was only 10. This poem on Monsieur Hussey and Coffin was published in the Newport, Rhode Island's Mercury. In 1773, Phyllis Wheatley became the first African American, the first slave, and the third female poet to publish a volume of poetry. Her volume consisted of 28 poems. At 13 years old, Phyllis Wheatley became a household name. She received national and international acclaim, known for the sophistication and elegance of her work, the use of classical and neoclassical poetry techniques, her use of biblical imagery, her passion for a new nation that was fighting for independence, and her very keen observations on life as a slave in the United States. Phyllis sent a poem to then General George Washington, and in 1776, Washington invited Wheatley to his headquarters in Massachusetts. Phyllis also got the chance to travel to Europe. She visited London where she was able to promote her volume of poetry and receive medical attention for her ongoing illnesses. When she returned to the United States, Wheatley encountered some hardships. John and Susanna Wheatley died only a few years apart from each other, as well as other members of the Wheatley family. Phyllis was freed from slavery and she married another free black person, John Peters. They lived together and struggled financially for the rest of her life. She had to work as a maid to help support the household. And she was able to continue writing, but wasn't able to find a publisher for her next volume of work. Phyllis died in 1784 in her early 30s. Her legacy lives on today. She paved a way for black female poets, black poets and poets in general for the many years to come and continues to inspire contemporary poets today. Today, we're actually going to look at one of her most iconic poems on being brought from Africa to America. Take a look. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption never sought nor knew, some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolical dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as Cain, may be refined and join the angelic train. Let's unpack. Firstly, I'd love to say that this poem and its brevity and its power speaks so well to Phyllis Wheatley's skill as a poet. In the first line, Wheatley does not attribute her capture to the savagery of the slave trade, but rather alludes to it being part of a bigger, somewhat utilitarian Christian mission, if you will, to save lives and souls. I find it interesting, her use of the word mercy here. 
mercy can be defined as a free act of God's compassion. It's ironic then that the exercising of one's freedom, here the slave traders, brought about the enslavement of another, the Africans. Phyllis sees Christianity as delivering her from paganism, which at the time was associated with barbarianism and savagery. In the next line, Wheatley describes her soul as being benighted, meaning taken over by moral and intellectual darkness or ignorance, thereby continuing this Christian view of paganism at the time. In line three, I find it interesting that she separates the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Savior, not only for the theological significance, but for the emphasis on her own ignorance to the need to be saved. This is confirmed in line four. She accepts her conversion to Christianity without resentment, but also without forgiveness. In lines five and six, Phyllis shifts from acknowledging the impact Christianity had on her life to commenting on the view of black people in white Christian societies. Note her use of the word sable. While sable can mean black, it can also refer to a carnivorous animal. Her use of the word therefore both alludes to the color of African skin, as well as calls out the view of blacks in white societies as being a more primal subaltern group of the human race. The phrase diabolic die refers to the perceived innate evilness of black people in white societies. Wheatley doubles down on this by bringing up Cain from the biblical story of Cain and Abel in line seven. In some traditional interpretations of Christianity, Cain is considered to be the originator of evil, violence, and greed. In Genesis, Cain kills his brother Abel after God prefers Abel's sacrifice over Cain's. Cain is then punished by God and cursed to wander the earth for the rest of his life. When Wheatley refers to her own people as being black as Cain, she's not necessarily speaking about skin color, but again referring to a perceived innate evilness of black people in white societies. She finishes out the poem with a call to action, saying that even those deemed barbaric or innately evil were worth converting. It's a call for white societies and people in general to strive for racial equality. As I revisited this poem, I struggled in my own interpretations of Wheatley's message. On one hand, some of the language lends itself to the racist view of black people and the pervasive superiority complex of Anglo-Saxon culture. On the other hand, you can detect an intensity and unforgivable nature in Wheatley's writing that does not subscribe to racism. The mere fact that Wheatley wrote this at such a young age is a testament to not only her own intelligence and creativity, but being so as an educated African woman. Thanks for tuning in to our first segment of Black Poets Then and Now. See you on Thursday for another edition.